Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. I hope you are excited with the new developments about MATLAB that we have introduced in the last lecture. If you haven't watched already and if you are not familiar with MATLAB in particular, I would highly recommend you to go and have a look at that particular lecture because we would be continuing the same idea throughout the series as to how we would be coding in MATLAB for our numerical problems. In today's lecture, we would be coming back on the notebook here and I would like to talk to you about how we actually solve a differential equation on a particular domain. So we will take a very simple example of a second order differential equation and if you remember we have already seen how we can discretize or how we can use finite differencing on second order derivatives. So we saw how we can use central difference forward difference and backward difference to evaluate a second order differencing term and today we are going to make use of that and see how we can use that idea to solve a problem. So let's jump right into it. So on the screen you can see the second order differencing for the, the forward, the backward and if I scroll a little bit up here that's the central difference scheme. So today we are going to take a very simple problem. So I'm going to take an example of d square y by dx square, which is a second order derivative, to be equals to zero. And of course, if this equation is satisfied somewhere, we have to have a domain. And because we only have one independent variable x, so we only have one d domain. So let us say this is our domain as represented by this line. And usually in CFD problems or any kind of numerical problems, there could be either an initial value problem or a boundary conditions based problem. So in here we would focus on the problems where we have pre-described boundary conditions. Otherwise, for instance, in the flow, you can have a zero inlet velocity or a finite inlet velocity and then you are supposed to calculate the flow evolution. Otherwise you can have the boundary conditions such as the velocity over a wall is supposed to be zero for instance. So in here we would be considering a problem which has a finite and constant boundary values and we want to see how the variable y it evolves in the flow domain or in the domain that is interior to this boundary. So in here I would say that uh, let's call this point as left and this point as right. And we would say that the xl is 0 and xr is 1. And these are the boundary conditions and they are not supposed to change. The entire uh, values of x in between the boundaries is supposed to be changed as told by the governing equation which is the second derivative of this equation is zero but the boundary conditions remain as it is and for any kind of numerical problems we need to have some sort of boundary conditions to help us to evaluate those uh, variables. So because this is such a simple equation we can definitely go for a theoretical approach so I'll first give you an idea of what this problem would look like. So if you integrate this equation it's very easy to know that after integrating in first we see that the dy by dx is k1 and if you integrate it again it means that y equals to k1x plus k2 and this is a very familiar equation of a straight line. So According to this equation, the variable y would behave linearly between the two boundary conditions or the boundary points. And we want to see how we can get this theoretical behavior or the expected behavior using the numerical schemes. So if you remember, we can write this d square y by dx square. And if I use the central difference for instance, central difference scheme then we can write y, oh, sorry, y i plus 1 minus, I'm really sorry for this, minus 2 y i plus y i minus 1 
divided by h square is 0. So now the problem comes as to how we would define these i plus 1, i and i minus 1. And that's where the concept of grid comes into the picture. So right now we have, suppose, this domain and we only know the position of the boundary points. Then for evaluating using numerical schemes, we divide this domain into some particular part, finite number of parts, and that is in a very nutshell called as the grid. So what we would do for this problem is, we take this entire domain and we divide it into say, five parts, just for the sake of clarity here. So I have my L point here, the R point here, but for the sake of numbering, I would call this as number one, this as number two, this is number 3, number 4, and number 5. I'm using the number 1, 2, 5 just because it doesn't get confusing in MATLAB. If I was coding the same problem in C, I would be more comfortable defining them to be from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. But for MATLAB, if you remember, the indexing starts from 1, and that's why the first point we are calling it as to be 1. And we know that. The value of uh, y variable that is y at 1 equals to 0 and y at 5 equals to 1. Now we want to see how we use the central differencing equation here. So let us say we, we keep uh, the circled equation, we keep it here and we put i equals to 2. Let's see what happens with and it becomes, the first term becomes y3 minus 2y2 plus y1 divided by h square, where h is the grid spacing equals to 0. And the grid spacing in this context wouldn't really matter because this, if you solve this equation, it says that y3 minus 2y2 plus y1 equals to 0. And if I were to generalize this, or if, I, if you put this circled equation equals to 0, it says that, and if I want to solve for yi, it means yi equals to 1 by 2, yi minus 1 plus yi plus 1. And this is this particular form is very important to us because it tells that the value of y at any point is the sum of its neighbors divided by 2 or the average of its neighbors. And this calls for what is called as an iterative process. So what that means is we initialize the problem. We say that initial, at initial conditions the y has some value, let us say it's 0 everywhere or it's 1 everywhere, the initial conditions wouldn't really matter until the problem is very sensitive to the initial conditions, which we are not going to cover. But as soon as you use this particular covariant equations, the value of y would change according to this particular equation here. So what that means is, if I want to talk to you about how this equation would be solved in a programming software, the first part would be to define the problem. And what that means is, you define how many points are there. So in this case, we have taken five points, but we have we can take as many points as we want, depending on how good your computer is. And that would give us also what is the value of the grid spacing edge. Then we define the boundary conditions. So in this case, the two boundary conditions are the left hand side is zero, the y at one is zero, and the y at five is one. And the Last part is initialize the problem. And what does initialization mean in this context is that for these points, these 2, 3, and 4, 
we assign some initial values so that we can start the calculations for that. So it's it's very common practice to use zero as the initial values, uh, and that works fairly well in all the situations. So when we would be dealing with the same problem in MATLAB, we would say that the boundary, the left boundary is zero, the right boundary is one, and all the other points are zero to be initialized. So once we have defined the problem, the next step comes is to uh, use the discretized form of governing equation. So I'll just write this GE called governing equation. And what that means is you used yi being the average of i plus 1 and i minus 1, that is its neighbors. And the way in which we apply this uh, discretization is that we know the left and right. So we first take, for instance, the second point here, and we say that the new value of second point or the new value of y2 is the average of the y1 and y3. So this way we get a new value of y2. Then we can move on to the next point, y3, which says that it's the new value at y3 is the average of y2 and y4. And here there are two options for you because you have already calculated what the y2 new is, but you also have what the y2 old is. So you can either use the new value or the old value. And these are two different kind of uh, methods that we use in the computational sciences. So we would stick to the old school method first. So we would say that the new value of y3 is the average of old values of y2 and y4. To make it more clear, I'll show you what I mean. So we had the same domain, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Let us say we define y1 equals to 0 and y5 equals to 1. That's the boundary condition. And we said that y2 equals to y3 equals to y4 equals to 0. So this is the problem definition. Now, according to the governing equation, we say that the y2 new equals to 1 by 2 y3 plus y1. And that gives us again 1 by 2, 0 plus 0 being 0. But this is supposed to be a new value while this is an old value. And if I want to calculate y3 new, I can write y2, 1 by 2, y4 plus y2. Now there are two options for us whether we want to use the y2 here or the new value of y2. So, generally when you use a newer value of y2, the calculations are slightly faster. And that would be the advantage because we are trying to evaluate our, the flow field or whatever the field that the equation provides. So, this would again be 1 by 2, 0 plus 0 means 0. And this way we would be doing for all the points. Now the question comes, for how long do we really want to do it? So in fluid dynamics problem, the continuity equation for instance is a very good indicator and we say that when the continuity equation on the entire flow domain is very small, if you remember the continuity equation says the net mass flow should be equal to zero and we force that uh, when the continuity residual, when the net mass flow is very small, then you stop the calculation. And in this problem, also we have to define the error. So in this case, a very simple way to define the error is, you take the new values, subtract it from the old values and sum it all up. And I'll also take the magnitude of that so that they are not negative and positive and cancel each other. So that's how we can define the error and we say that when the error is less than a certain tolerance or any kind of uh, 
threshold value, then you stop the calculation. And if the error is more than this threshold, then we keep doing this uh, procedure of taking the average of the two neighbors. So, to quickly summarize, we had a domain, we had the boundary conditions, and we initialized the problem. That's the part one. The part two is to solve the problem until the, we get the error threshold. And what that means is we keep on iterating to get the y until this conditions, that is the new value of y minus the old value of y. When it is summed over all these points, it reduces or it drops below a threshold value. And that is when we stop the calculations. And this also calls me to stop the lecture here because I wanted to use the same problem and to show you how we can write a MATLAB code for you. So that would be covered in the next lecture and we want to see how the code would evaluate all these three steps. So stay tuned for that. And in case if you have any questions or if anything is not clear here, please feel free to drop in the comments below. I'll try my best to help you out very soon. And thank you very much for watching. I hope you are enjoying the series. I highly appreciate any sort of feedback that you might be having here. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already subscribed so that uh, you can get notifications regarding my new videos. I'll see you very soon with another video on MATLAB where we will be uh, solving this problem. Stay safe and take care. Bye-bye.